The Chinese word for crisis is made with two brush strokes, JFK once said, according to the interwebs. The one stroke means danger. The other brush stroke means opportunity. In a crisis, we need to be aware of the danger, but we also need to be on the lookout for the opportunity. I fact-checked uh, old uh, JFK's linguistics skills with one of you who knows Mandarin better than I do, and apparently better than he does, and it does not check out, but <laughs> his rhetorical point, I think, is still an interesting one, isn't it? That in a crisis, there is this innate ambivalence. I don't mean ambivalence like, eh, danger, opportunity, not really that stoked about either one. But ambivalence like ambivalence, two potentialities that are resident in any crisis. Things in a crisis can go one of two directions. Our English word crisis comes from an old Greek word that means judgment or to decide or to discern, to find out. And there's this sense that in a crisis, not only are things at a tipping point where a decision must be made, but a crisis, a crisis situation erodes the supports from around us such that our foundation is found out. It is discerned in a crisis. Many of you have been through crises in your own lives, perhaps in organizations that you lead where there is a trajectory-defining season, a crisis for the leadership. Perhaps you've experienced it in your own life, a rupture in your health or the health of a loved one. Maybe the financial bottom has dropped out. Maybe in your marriage there has been fraying and stretching to the point of snap. Crisis. We all go through crises at various times in our lives. Some of you perhaps even this morning are discerning that you are headed into a season of crisis and my hope is that this morning's message is encouraging to you. Before we get around to that, let me remind you where we are. We are in the church calendar season called Advent. If you didn't grow up with Advent, uh, the corny way that we're remembering what Advent is about is what your parents maybe told you when they were teaching you to cross the street. You stop, you wait, and you look both ways. That's what we do in Advent. We deliberately pause from the cluttering busyness of this season and we wait. We actively enter a time of waiting. We urge our hearts to wait and we look back through history with our ancestors in the faith, those who came before the first coming of Jesus. And we imaginatively try to wait alongside them, longing for and hoping for this long promised rescuer, the Messiah. And then we look the other way from our perch in history in 2018, the close of 2018 on the corner of 31st and Barclay in Baltimore City. And we look forward into the future and we try to sharpen our own hunger pangs for the return of Jesus. The way we've been doing that, the way we've been sharpening our hunger pangs is, uh, is to look each week at one of Jesus' ancestors. Matthew, when he set out to uh, tell the story of the life of Jesus, he gave us this kind of Ancestry.com list at the beginning because I think he understood that if we understood Jesus' people, we'll understand and appreciate Jesus better. So last week, we looked at his ancestors, Sarah and Abraham. This week, we're looking at Hezekiah. And each week, what we do is we take a look at the way those ancestors of Jesus got it right without exception. The things they did well are amplified in Jesus. And we also look at where they got it woefully wrong sometimes. And that's encouraging, to me at least. But also we let that develop in us an appetite for where Jesus gets it wholly, perfectly, life-givingly right every time. I will pray for us, and uh, in just a moment, we'll get down to work. This morning, we're going to look at Hezekiah. 
He crops up in Matthew chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. I think we can put that on the screen for you. I'm not going to read it just because it's a list of names, but I want you to see that's there, and I'm not making stuff up. Let me pray, and then we'll get down to work. Father, I, I just ask that you would come be with us by your Spirit, praying this is just a natural outgrowth of believing that you exist, that you're real, that you promise to show up with your people when we gather in your name, and that these words, ancient, ancient as they are, distant and dusty and strange as they seem, that you inspired them. So it only makes sense to ask you to come be with us by your spirit and help us to get the imaginations of our hearts inside this text, to submit ourselves to your authority in it, to hear your voice, and to follow you as our one true shepherd. I pray that you would do that for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hezekiah is king of what's known as the southern kingdom. The people of God, the Jewish people, were split into two kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom that was by and large the, the larger, more powerful kingdom. And in general, it was a little bit further down the slope of desertion from the one true God. Judah, the southern kingdom, smaller, less powerful, in a more uh, challenging climate, more mountainous terrain, and its capital city is Jerusalem. And there were a few kings and people in the southern kingdom who were more faithful to God. And Hezekiah, by and large, is one of the good apples in a long, deep barrel of bad apples. The year is... 700 BC, Hezekiah uh, ascends to the throne as a 25-year-old, so he's just finished his first graduate degree from Hopkins, and now he's working at McDonald's to pay it off. <laughs> Somebody hands him the crown, and four short years later, he's 29, and there is a specter on the horizon. The superpower uh, far north, called Assyria, has begun marauding southwards, and they maraud through the sibling nation Israel to the north, which is more powerful than Judah. They devastate Israel, and they return to the north. A short decade later, Hezekiah is not yet 40, and a new king in Assyria, a king named Sennacherib, begins marauding southwards again, this time all the way through Samaria, Israel, the land they'd already conquered, into, deep into Judah. Sennacherib demands uh, shakedown money from Hezekiah. So Hezekiah uh, empties, just guts the temple treasuries, the national treasuries, oh, even so far as stripping the gold off the temple doors in order to pay this shakedown payment to Sennacherib. And then it's like the, the nightmare just keeps going in slow motion. Sennacherib takes the money and just keeps on coming. And his people... His army lays siege to the walls of Jerusalem, the capital city. They surround this last stronghold of the people of God in the mountains of Judah. And Hezekiah sends his officers outside the city walls to have a little tete-a-tete with the officers of Sennacherib. And you can read this story, the, 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 story, the main episodes of the life of Hezekiah, three different, that's four, three different places in the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapters 18 through 20, Isaiah chapters 36 through 39, and uh, 2 Chronicles 32. Uh, each tells more or less the same story with minor variations depending upon the overall purposes of those authors. We're going to dip into each one of them a little bit this morning. But here's the scene. Jerusalem's under siege. Hezekiah's not yet 40. This is a crisis. He sends his officers outside the city walls to meet with Sennacherib's officers, and these Assyrians are not novices in the game of mongering fear. 
Instead of having a quiet, polite, diplomatic discussion, they shout their message to Hezekiah's officers so that their words of fear can be heard by the residents of the city standing on the city walls a few yards away. We pick up the story here in 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 28 through 36. Then the chief of staff stood and shouted in Hebrew to the people on the wall, listen to this message from the great king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He'll never be able to to rescue you from my power. Don't let him fool you into trusting in the Lord by saying, the Lord will surely rescue us. This city will never fall into the hands of the Assyrian king. Don't listen to Hezekiah. These are the terms the king of Assyria is offering. Make peace with me. Open the gates and come out. Then each of you can continue eating from your own grapevine and fig tree and drinking from your own well. Then I will arrange to take you to another land like this one, a land of grain and new wine, bread and vineyards, olive groves and honey. Choose life instead of death. Don't listen to Hezekiah when he tries to mislead you by saying the Lord will rescue us. Have the gods of any other nations ever saved their people from the king of Assyria? What happened to the gods of Hamath and Arpad? And what about the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Eva? Did any god rescue Samaria, that's the northern kingdom, from my power? What god of any nation has ever been able to save its people from my power? So what makes you think that the Lord can rescue Jerusalem from me? But the people were silent and did not utter a word because Hezekiah had commanded them, do not answer him. All of this shouted loudly enough for the residents of the city to hear it and for the crisis to spread like wildfire. My guess is that each of you can relate to this crisis. Not that you've been a king, not that you have led a city under siege. If you have, talk to me. We have openings in children's ministry. But um, (laughs) but crises often show up with similar messaging. The blunt thrust of fear. We didn't read the message they gave before this one, but it was essentially this. Fear always plays on pain and loss. If you don't make peace with us, if you don't open your gates to us, you will suffer like you've never suffered. If you do bend your knee to King Sennacherib, you will experience loss of all that is most dear to you. That's what fear always plays on in a crisis, this blunt thrust of fear that pushes on our expectation of pain and our fear of loss. And the theological subtext of fear is almost always God is insufficient to take care of you in this situation. God is insufficient to take care of you in this situation. Remember, about four years ago, Jill and I were in, late in our discernment process about whether or not to be part of uh, helping to start what became St. Mo's. I had been looking uh, fresh at the, uh, the statistics of church plant failures, and she was very pregnant with our second kid, and I was feeling all of the kind of positive needs to be responsible for my family. And she and I sat in a meeting with the elders of Central, our, our primary mother church. And I remember looking across the table at them and saying, you know, it's hard enough to get a job in the real world coming out of a church work background. But if we give the latter half of our 30s to starting a church named after an obscure Ethiopian saint and it crashes and burns, who's going to hire that guy? It's, this is what I said, it's, it's not that I don't trust that God can take care of us. It's And as I looked across the table at their faces and tried to come up with a second half to that sentence, (laughs) I realized that we all realized that's exactly what it was. And I realized the elders of Central knew, yes, there might well be loss. Yes, there will be pain. 
is God sufficient to take care of me in this situation? Or since most of our lives are deeply intertwined with the lives of others, is God sufficient to take care of us in this situation? The messaging of a crisis so often leads with the blunt thrust of fear, pain, loss. However, the Assyrians were not novices. They gave a more sophisticated message than just that, and they candy-coated the fear with the coaxing of confusion. Look at verse 31 and 32. If you make peace with us, then just come out. You can each continue eating from your own grapevine. You can eat from your own fig tree. You can have your own well. And, and, and what's more, I will lead you from this place to another land that's just like this one, dare I say, even better. You can have artisanal olive oil and fine-aged wine. Choose life instead of death. Some of you recognize that they're quoting scripture. And this confusion is meant to open up a question in the minds of all who hear these words from the top of the city walls. The theological subtext of this confusion is God's intentions for you are not as good as others on offer. Or I'll put it another way. If you are following this one whom you call the Lord and you find yourself under siege and you're eating only bread and water, you make peace with Sennacherib, you could have fine crostini and wonderful olive oil and vintage wine and eat at your own table and feel freedom then are you perhaps on the wrong team? That's the message of confusion with this subtext. Maybe someone else has better intentions for you than God does. This is the crisis that gets thrown up to Hezekiah. And you'll notice that the both theological subtexts, both of them speak about God as if he's not even there in the middle of the crisis. I remember in 2001, I was uh, leading uh, a ministry organization uh, that entered a season of crisis. And some of you are like, well, you just explained it in the first half of that sentence. Um, you guys will get that in a minute. <sighs> Maybe it wasn't that good. <laughs> and... I, this was my first time leading a large organization through a, a significant period of difficulty and transition. And uh, a, a young woman who had led this organization prior to me sent me this note. And this is uh, the, what the note said. I think that's right there. She said, Dear Ian, there isn't really any such thing as a crisis, by which she meant there's nothing that really, at the end of the day, comes out of the blue. And what is happening with uh, this situation is no exception. God is not confused or surprised. When he put you in your position, he knew you would have to deal with this and has been preparing you and equipping you. And then she goes on to quote 2 Peter chapter 1. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. The theological subtext of both fear and confusion talk about God as if he's not there, and yet the main way to get through crisis is by turning to God, turning to the one who feels like he is not there. He is not surprised by this situation. St. John of the Cross, a 15th century, 16th century Spanish mystic, wrote a book called uh, The Dark Hour of the Soul. And it's mainly about what we might call experiencing spiritual dryness in prayer. But his larger point is one that I think applies to us this morning, and that it's we grow passively and actively. We grow in Jesus 
passively and actively. Actively, we grow by, by walking in the way of Jesus quite consciously, by doing the ancient practices of, of scripture reading and of silence and of solitude and of prayer and of generosity and of service. These things help us to grow up in Jesus, but also there's a passive way of growing, and that only happens when God puts us in situations where we feel like we are out of control. A crisis. A moment where all of our supports are eroded away and the foundation on which we are standing, the thing we trust most, is revealed. Dark nights of the soul. Hezekiah is perhaps most known for the way he responded to this crisis, and this is what he does. Sennacherib sends him a letter threatening devastation, and he takes that letter, and in 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 14 through 19, this is what he does. After Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it, he went up before the Lord's temple and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed this prayer before the Lord. O Lord, God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens of the earth. Bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your ears, O Lord, and see. Listen to Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. It's true, Lord. The kings of the Assyrians have destroyed all these nations. And they've thrown down the gods of these nations into the fire and burned them. But of course the Assyrians could destroy them. They were not gods at all, only idols of wood and stone shaped by human hands. Now, O Lord our God, rescue us from his power. Then all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Hezekiah is not cowed by the blunt thrust of fear. He's not confused by the coax of a better offer, a seemingly better offer elsewhere. Instead, he leads the people in deeper into faithfulness, spreads the letter out before the Lord and says, God, you have not been caught by surprise. How will you show your faithfulness to us once more? Jesus heir to Hezekiah, had his own dark night of the soul. No one else around him knew it. His friends and followers knew that there was opposition to him, that it was growing and increasing, but that Thursday night when he shared a final meal with them and shared a cup with them and sang a hymn with them and led them out to an olive orchard overlooking the walls that Sennacherib had besieged, None of them knew, as he asked them to pray with him, and they fell asleep glutted on his death row meal, none of them knew that even then Boots were marching to drag him into his crisis. So Jesus, it says in Matthew's gospel, bent down with his face to the ground near the spot where the olives were crushed into oil, his own soul crushed with grief. And he said this, my father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Jesus, heir to Hezekiah, faithful in a crisis, even to the point of death. Hezekiah faced another crisis, though, a crisis of a different sort. The kingdom had rebounded through his faithfulness, um, his good leadership. The treasuries were full once again. He had a health crisis, uh, which he'd survived. 
God had miraculously healed him after he had prayed. And now the eyes of the region are on him. Some emissaries from a land called Babylon show up with gifts, their suitcases burgeoning with treasure to greet, to honor Hezekiah and to uh, congratulate him on his recovery of health. And I have no doubt in my mind that Hezekiah in this moment near the end of his life with foreign diplomats coming, bringing their treasure to congratulate him, that he, in his mind, is remembering the stories he learned in that very city as a kid. The good old days when Solomon was king and the kingdom was large and diplomats from foreign lands and even the queen of Sheba came bringing their treasure to the kings of God's people. And here, once more, are foreign emissaries in the very city where he resides, bringing their treasure to the throne he occupies. And he must be thinking, am I the one to lead us back into our glory days? Let's make Judah marvelous again. And the way the story goes, he leads these two emissaries from Babylon on a tour of all that he owns and all the wealth of the kingdom. And the way Isaiah chapter 39 puts it, he showed them everything. And at that moment, after they leave, there's a knock on the door and Isaiah, the prophet of the Lord, shows up, gulp, and says, hey, Hezekiah, who are your new friends? Hezekiah tells him. Where are they from? Hezekiah tells him. What'd you show them? Everything. I showed them everything. And this is the message that Isaiah goes on to give Hezekiah. Listen to this message from the Lord of Heaven's armies. The time is coming when everything in your palace, all the treasures stored up by your ancestors until now, will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your very own sons will be taken away into exile. They will become eunuchs who will serve in the palace of Babylon's king. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, this message you have given me from the Lord is good. For the king was thinking, at least there will be peace and security during my lifetime. I don't know if that strikes an ominous note with you. It certainly does for me. It's a little vague. This is exactly the way that Isaiah's telling of the story and King's telling of the story leave it. Vague, but with this ominous ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. Second Chronicles pulls back the curtain, as it were, and this is the way Second Chronicles tells us what was going on. However, when ambassadors arrived from Babylon to ask about the remarkable events that had taken place in the land, God withdrew from Hezekiah in order to test him and to see what was really in his heart. And his vanity unlocked the kingdom for the next generation to be pillaged and dragged off captives. There's a woman, Ethiopian woman, known as uh, Sarah. She lived, uh, she was a contemporary of our own St. Moses. Uh, she was uh, from an aristocratic family, well-educated, um, a brilliant Bible scholar, and she gave up all of those perks to lead the contemplative life. She was a woman who knew both accolades and austerity. And this is what uh, Ama Syncletica wrote. Just as it's impossible to be at the same moment both a plant and a seed, so it's impossible for us to be surrounded by worldly honor and at the same time to bear heavenly fruit. I think maybe what she's pointing to with the plant and seed imagery is that there is a dying to worldly honor, to the pursuit of worldly honor that must take place in order for heavenly fruit to be born. A wise woman. 
Jesus, his star was on the ascent at many times during his career. There were days when people saw so much potential in this young carpenter. They saw, as it were, the royal beneath the rube that they wanted to grab him and make him their leader so they could ride his coattails on up. I think, though, for me, the most poignant moment where Jesus faces the question of vanity is early on in his career. He hasn't yet done much to earn him accolades, and he has for 40 days been fasting, going without food in the harsh Judean wilderness. And the enemy of mankind, the accuser of humanity, who the Bible calls Satan, slithers up to him and starts whispering sweet talk in his ear. He tempts him three times, two other temptations, and then the coup de grace, flattery. He offers Jesus the world, literally. That's what it says, Matthew chapter 4. He takes him to the top of a very high mountain, presumably in a dream or on Google Earth or something like that, because otherwise the geometry doesn't work out. And he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he says, I will give it to you, all of it. All you have to do is kneel down, worship me, kiss the ring. And Jesus, in the moment that he refuses that flattery, is the first and only human to resist that flattery to resist the arc towards self-worship and instead to worship God alone. And in that moment, it's like an inversion of that scene all those years before when the same snake slithered in a garden up to Eve and Adam and began to flatter them. In that moment, this king begins to put all the wrongs to right. In that moment, God starts making all things new. Do you see the contrast? Hezekiah's vanity opened the gates for the enemy to come in and to drag off the next generation into captivity. Jesus' humility pillaged the enemy's fortress, and rescued the captives. Do you see it? A couple's vanity subjected humans to a curse of sin and death, and Jesus' humble obedience and worship of God alone broke the curse. This is Jesus, heir to Hezekiah, king of the world. He has come. He will come again. Our hope is hinged to his two comings. I don't know if you were struck by the generational self-centeredness of Hezekiah, but I was. I know this week that just sat with me in a bad way. He's told by the prophet Isaiah that his kingdom will fall and he sort of ho-hums, well, at least there will be peace and security in my lifetime. He's content with his exaltation at the expense of the next generation's humiliation. Jesus is content with his humiliation so that you and I might be lifted up. His last thoughts are for himself. Jesus' last words on the cross are, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. John, will you take care of my mother? Into your hands I commit my spirit. It's finished. And hearing that generational self-centeredness in Hezekiah 
kindled something in me that I've talked to you guys about before with respect to my hopes for St. Mo's. When I've talked about it before, I've talked about it in the context of seeing orchards in Israel that have been planted by women and men who knew that they would not harvest the best fruits of that orchard, but another generation would. And I've said, I hope that we can be a church family with that sort of long view. But hearing this morning how Jesus perfected Hezekiah, I think that's no longer good enough. We can't say it's okay as long as there's peace and security in our lifetime. My hope is that St. Mo's, that we would be willing to, to do the hard thing, to embrace a difficult path, to, to, to take on uh, uh, humbling and decentering of self in our crisis so that the next generation and the generation after that of church in Baltimore might be in a better position than today. That's my hope. And when I say that I have in mind things like the difficult and oh-so-worth-it years we have ahead of becoming a multi-ethnic church that is not just different faces in the pew all reading from a white script. And when I say that, I don't know whether you and I will ever, in our lifetime, have a day when, when people of different colors, races, are treating each other in church as God's people ought to fully treat each other. But I do hope this, that the second graders downstairs in Moe's kids, if we are willing to sacrifice this, the second graders downstairs in Moe's kids will grow up and be starting their leadership of tomorrow's Baltimore church in a completely different place than you, most of us, have begun. When I say this, I have in mind sacrificially giving in a way that is not necessarily going to be harvested here in slicker programs or in better buildings or in shorter sermons or whatever it is you most desire, but that might end up meaning that a church in East Baltimore can own a building or a pastor in East Baltimore can work one job instead of three. When I say this, I have in mind the difficult journey of singleness that some of you are on, refusing to cow to the fear that there is, you are missing out on something better for you that you cannot have and refusing to turn aside to the clucking, coaxing confusion that somebody else can offer you something better than God will and instead you take the message of your crisis into the presence of the Lord and you say, Father, how are you going to show yourself faithful one more time? So that the next generation and the generation after that one are standing on the shoulders of women and men who have made the sufficiency of God shine in our time through their singleness. That's the sort of thing I have in mind. It's not enough to be happy that there's peace and security in our day as if there were. Crises come in all different shapes and sizes, but there's some predictability to it. They come at the bottom of the mountain in the dark night of the soul, and they come at the top of the mountain. They come in privation, and they come in plenty. They come in open public testings, and they come in quiet, hidden, personal trials. but there's some similarity to them all. They expose what we're standing on. They pull away our supports. They try to make us fear. They try to coax us. They try to confuse us. They ask, who is it that you're trusting? One of the great privileges of being in my seat is watching you guys engage with faithfulness and wisdom and courage and love in the trials that emerge in your lives. And watching you support one another through those trials. Watching you 
encourage one another towards faith and faithfulness in God and obedience like my friend Laura did with that note. A reminder that though he might seem absent, nothing has caught him by surprise. It's my hope that increasingly we become a church family who helps one another through these sorts of crises and that we walk out the other side grown up a little bit more in him. But I also know from my own experience that I don't always make it out the other side of these trials with flying colors. Sometimes I botch it. And sometimes we're going to look more like Hezekiah in the second crisis than in the first. So my reminder to you this morning is that our rescue rests not on the way you conduct yourself through each of life's crises, but your rescue rests with the one who has passed every test, completed every trial, been faithful in every situation, even unto death. He has come. He will come again. Our hope is hinged to his two comings. He's making all things new. And we walk into the trials of today and tomorrow with our eyes fixed on him, keeping in step with his spirit. Let's pray, and then we'll go to the table. Father, would you do in our hearts what I can't do with my words? For my sisters and brothers here this morning who are in times of trial or crisis known only to themselves, I pray that you would give the balm of your spirit and the encouragement that they are not alone, that they need not fear for you are with them. And you are a God who has proven yourself to be faithful. I pray that you would make us a church family who is not generationally self-centered, but who's willing perhaps even to embrace humbling that the next generation might be lifted up. And I pray that you would make us a church family who grab each other by the arm and say, let's go unfurl the message of this crisis in the presence of the Lord and ask him to show himself to be faithful once more. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.